the sound of distance. Your son is trying to kill you. He's thinking about it and you know this. You suggest a walk on the beach, idle water, the distractions of sand dunes and wind, the need for words lost to it when speech was still forming. He's been in his room for months, you say, but it's 15 years, really. You make pasta he has to navigate so you can watch him twist a fork around the loose bits, sometimes sucking the dangling threads of food into his mouth as he inhales one eye on you and it vanishes into the slurping silence of another mealtime. You say, isn't this nice? And it is this moment of him eating, his jawline jutting through pale skin, fingers tapping, throat flexing, and without realizing, his chewing becomes all the noise you can hope for. A little boy, all pudgy shivering, togs falling off the crease of his bum, sand between his floppy toes, feet in your hands rubbing them warm, Smiles sitting in the back of the car, just the two of you. His favourite blanket, your fussing. Oh, the weightless quiet. The thud you hear after you hear it, lives in rear mirrors, too late to react when a deer propels itself into headlights. Each time you plummet into the depth of your child. Birthday cards unopened. Thank you. Um, the second poem uh, hopes to confront the beauty myth, uh, society's pressures foisted on women. Anyone who knows me, I see Saoirse there, my daughter, she'll know this is my usual rant. Um, uh, the, the, the pressures foisted on women, you know, and especially young women to be beautiful and obedient and that this is considered our only value. As women, we are bombarded with ideas on how we should look and act. This poem is a journey through the aging process as seen through the metaphor of a once loved cat. Cat without clothes. The body ticks its skeletal tuck along skin, armory matted, graying in places. Time scab flesh protrudes over potions. A thinning lip smudges claret onto the filter tip of a barbed wire cigarette. She was adored once, a noisy mechanical toy and gourmet food portions in petite pouches for her first Christmas. A diamante collar followed the following year. Then the Tom arrived. Wretched side streets became home, an endless colony of fur flouncing behind, the stooped decline reversed in a series of doorways, respite from the hissing years. Then the Tom returned. Late in life she reappeared, a burden in the forgiveness of things, and I, without shame, salvaged the dazzling collar from a box in the attic and punctured a new hole for her emaciated heart. Thank you. Just have a drink of water. Uh, the next poem is called uh, Shadow Waiting in Memory of a Mother in Baby Homes. Uh, I went to a convent, Sisters of Charity Secondary School, and attached to the convent was, was a laundry, which we, St. Mary's, which we later found out was a mountain and laundry. Um, and a few years ago, I watched a documentary on the lives of women imprisoned in these institutions and the lifelong de devastation they endured. And this poem speaks of one of the women interviewed. Shadow waiting. It's always November. Always 5 a.m. and you lie rigid in a cooling sweat. Dawn yet to reach under the bolted door. Some hours earlier you sat rocking at a bedsit window. A couple, arm in arm, cavort under shafts of orange. The distant shadows of love are unbearable. 
You are folding a sheet, tracing the edges with aging fingertips back and forth along each crease. You do this most nights. Others you spend polishing a brass flower vase. The thump of boots on the stairs propels you under the bed where you remain with the sin of unworn leather shoes. In the forgiveness of mourning, you lean in, sit watching mothers walk away from their children, unsure if they blow a kiss. The day congregates around you in silence until once again, black noise descends, then separates, revealing faces, names, screams. It's 40 years since you were spared the sc shaved scalp, holy linen, bunches of rosary beads as improvised fists, your baby. 40 more years waiting for them to come for you. Thank you. The next poem is a, a little kind of short poem, um, uh, which I wrote out in well, it was inspired on one of my walks out in Isadel. I, I spent so much time out walking around beaches and woods and things like that. And um, I'm fascinated by the sea. You know, I love to get into the sea, but I'm also terrified of, I'm terrified of seaweed. Um, and you know how vast it is and, uh, and the risks you take actually every time you go swimming. But this poem imagines trusting the sea and what that would feel like. Dredge. I allow one thought to drown my current idolization of this walking to and beyond the debris of the shoreline. Mutilated crabs upturned, bloated stomachs hardening under a rigid winter sun, guts thin trails snared in shriveled seaweed, several dismembered pincers crusting some feet away, dusty sea salt coating the edges of my lips, and I lick, lick, suck hard until bitter grit softens under my tongue. And I am alert again to its impurities, intent on pushing forward past the line of washed up shells, many shattered by my pacing back and forth. And further, on the unrelenting horizon, seagulls speckle a trawler's mast. I think I can swim to, I think. Thank you. Um, an older poem now. Um, I wrote this poem a few years ago, and um, it's just like a mind trip, really. It's it's imagining the body as a template, and how we kind of repeat and repeat and repeat the same same habits on loop, and sometimes make little progress and end up back where we start. This is called Cooled Boiled Water. I am trying to bend a mind. Can I imagine the moon as a suffocating balloon, ready to inhale, siphoning lungs from the earth, which is a cardboard box of discarded toys, metal and plastic? Or stars the eyes of the wolf pack in the dark world forest, glaring behind spindly trees, which are needles in a pincushion, just that. Or rivers as paths guzzling swamped ground, drowning the carcasses of roads that lead home, which is a state of familiarity only. Or bodies as a surface to sketch new ways, tracing escape routes through veins, which are tracks of blood, which are cooled boiled water, dredging metal and plastic from a cardboard box, while starry eyes take aim with spindly pins and puncture flesh. And the river path devours familiarity and sketches are cuts on a skin map, bleeding cooled, boiled water. Thank you. Um, how are we doing, Isabel? You all right? Yeah, really good, Maeve. However many you want to do, I'm sure we are all pleasantly enjoying it. 
Um, this next poem, uh, it's kind of on a softer maybe poem, uh, Knitting Wounds is, uh, I suppose if, if you consider the mind as a needle and thread or a set of knitting needles, you know, and weaving a new perspective, repairing old wounds, the body and mind healed by self-care, I suppose is what this poem is trying to say. Knitting Wounds. I want to say they carry on to every injury. They are temporary knots, sensory loop of unhealing. But look closer as they knit. Each hurt is a duet of needles composing a scar. They clack, clack, weave like dream patterns at 4 a.m. But in time, its harmonies purl, each wound immersed by lyrical machines of tone kind voices. At their busiest point, thumbs don't puncture. This is self-care. Contracted as skin is by each penetrating stitch. It is bodies of texture, construction, constructing a flesh cardigan from wool. Thank you. Um, the next poem uh is mute marriage and this is about the everyday of love my husband's not here he's at work so uh he won't maybe it's, it's okay i can read it no it's cool and um, it's about the mechanisms that keep the machine going of love you know the machine of love and they those same habitual tickings that can also be a time bomb so this is mute marriage the slight discomfort we compare to warm rain, the excitement when tinged by it until coats stiffen and smell. Faint shock dimples your cheeks, discovering hearts to form because of a callousness in us. You haven't been listening, my love. Thoughts fester because of them. I can't locate our voices. Talk of futures, scattering pasts here and where. Unopened tube of confetti on the back seat the morning after. At the retail park, I am treading tarmac with the water god who has churched me, waiting for my life to be over or forgiven. I call you because a tire is flat. I want to admit winter is cruelly in us. Blessings are a curse. Rooks know our plans. I live in dread most days of the low set allies our youngest son careens the back roads on. I couldn't bear to lose his life, I say, and wait years to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. 